Chapter Eleven of The Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Stanley. The Wonderful City of Oz. Even with eyes protected by the green spectacles, Dorothy and her friends were at first dazzled by the brilliancy of the wonderful city. The streets were lined with beautiful houses, all built of green marble and studded everywhere with sparkling emeralds. They walked over a pavement of the same green marble, and where the blocks were joined together were rows of emeralds, set closely and glittering in the brightness of the sun. The window panes were of green glass. Even the sky above the city had a green tint, and the rays of the sun were green. There were many people, men, women and children, walking about, and these were all dressed in green clothes and had greenish skins. They looked at Dorothy and her strangely assorted company with wondering eyes, and the children all ran away and hid behind their mothers when they saw the lion, but no one spoke to them. Many shops stood in the street, and Dorothy saw that everything in them was green. Green candy and green popcorn were offered for sale, as well as green shoes, green hats, and green clothes of all sorts. At one place a man was selling green lemonade, and when the children bought it, Dorothy could see that they paid for it with green pennies. There seemed to be no horses nor animals of any kind. The men carried things around in little green carts, which they pushed before them. Everyone seemed happy and contented and prosperous. The guardian of the gates led them through the streets until they came to a big building, exactly in the middle of the city, which was the Palace of Oz, the Great Wizard. There was a soldier before the door, dressed in a green uniform, and wearing a long green beard. "'Here are strangers,' said the guardian of the gates to him, "'and they demand to see the great Oz.' "'Step inside,' answered the soldier, "'and I will carry your message to him.' So they passed through the palace gates, and were led into a big room, with the green carpet and lovely green furniture set with emeralds. The soldier made them all wipe their feet upon a green mat before entering this room, and when they were seated he said politely, "'Please make yourselves comfortable.' while I go to the door of the throne room and tell Oz you are here. They had to wait a long time before the soldier returned. When at last he came back, Dorothy asked, Have you seen Oz? Oh, no, returned the soldier. I have never seen him, but I spoke to him as he sat behind his screen and gave him your message. He said he will grant you an audience if you so desire, but each one of you must enter his presence alone, and he will admit but one each day. Therefore... As you must remain in the palace for several days, I will have you shown to rooms where you may rest in comfort after your journey. Thank you, replied the girl. That is very kind of Oz. The soldier now blew upon a green whistle, and at once a young girl, dressed in a pretty green silk gown, entered the room. She had lovely green hair and green eyes, and she bowed low before Dorothy as she said, Follow me and I will show you to your room. So Dorothy said good-bye to all her friends except Toto, and taking the dog in her arms, followed the green girl through seven passages, and up three flights of stairs, until they came to a room at the front of the palace. It was the sweetest little room in the world, with a soft, comfortable bed that had sheets of green silk and a green velvet counterpane. There was a tiny fountain in the middle of the room that shot a spray of green perfume into the air, to fall back into a beautifully carved green marble basin. Beautiful green flowers stood in the windows, and there was a shelf with a row of little green books. When Dorothy had time to open these books, she found them full of queer green pictures that made her laugh. They were so funny. In a wardrobe were many green dresses made of silk and satin and velvet, and all of them fitted Dorothy exactly. "'Make yourself perfectly at home,' said the green girl. And if you wish for anything, ring the bell. Oz will send for you tomorrow morning. She left Dorothy alone and went back to the others. These she also led to rooms, and each one of them found himself lodged in a very pleasant part of the palace. Of course, his politeness was wasted on the scarecrow, for when he found himself alone in his room, he stood stupidly in one spot, just within the doorway, to wait till morning. It would not rest him to lie down, and he could not close his eyes so he remained all night staring at a little spider which was weaving its web in a corner of the room, just as if it were not one of the most wonderful rooms in the world. 
the tin woodman lay down on his bed from force of habit for he remembered when he was made of flesh but not being able to sleep he passed the night moving his joints up and down to make sure they kept in good working order the lion would have preferred a bed of dried leaves in the forest and did not like being shut up in a room but he had too much sense to let this worry him so he sprang upon the bed and rolled himself up like a cat and purred himself asleep in a minute the next morning after breakfast the green maiden came to fetch dorothy and she dressed her in one of the prettiest gowns made of green brocaded satin dorothy put on a green silk apron and tied a green ribbon around toto's neck and they started for the throne room of the great oz first they came to a great hall in which were many ladies and gentlemen of the court all dressed in rich costumes these people had nothing to do but talk to each other but they always came to wait outside the throne room every morning although they were never permitted to see oz as dorothy entered they looked at her curiously and one of them whispered are you really going to look upon the face of oz the terrible of course answered the girl if he will see me oh he will see you said the soldier who had taken her message to the wizard although he does not like to have people ask to see him indeed at first he was angry and said i should send you back where you came from then he asked me what you looked like and when i mentioned your silver shoes he was very much interested at last i told him about the mark upon your forehead and he decided he would admit you to his presence just then a bell rang and the green girl said to dorothy that is the signal you must go into the throne room alone she opened a little door and dorothy walked boldly through and found herself in a wonderful place it was a big round room with a high arched roof and the walls and ceiling and floor were covered with large emeralds set closely together in the centre of the roof was a great light as bright as the sun which made the emeralds sparkle in a wonderful manner but what interested dorothy most was the big throne of green marble that stood in the middle of the room it was shaped like a chair and sparkled with gems as did everything else in the centre of the chair was an enormous head without a body to support it or any arms or legs whatever there was no hair upon this head but it had eyes and a nose and mouth and was much bigger than the head of the biggest giant as dorothy gazed upon this in wonder and fear the eyes turned slowly and looked at her sharply and steadily then the mouth moved and dorothy heard a voice say i am oz the great and terrible who are you and why do you seek me it was not such an awful voice as she had expected to come from the big head so she took courage and answered i am dorothy the small and meek i have come to you for help the eyes looked at her thoughtfully for a full minute then said the voice where did you get the silver shoes i got them from the wicked witch of the east when my house fell on her and killed her she replied where did you get the mark upon your forehead continued the voice that is where the good witch of the north kissed me when she bade me good-bye and sent me to you said the girl again the eyes looked at her sharply and they saw she was telling the truth then oz asked what do you wish me to do send me back to kansas where my aunt em and uncle henry are she answered earnestly i don't like your country although it is so beautiful and i'm sure aunt em will be dreadfully worried over my being away so long the eyes winked three times and then they turned up to the ceiling and down to the floor and rolled around so queerly that they seemed to see every part of the room and at last they looked at dorothy again why should i do this for you asked oz because you are strong and i am weak because you are a great wizard and i am only a little girl but you were strong enough to kill the wicked witch of the east said oz that just happened turned dorothy simply i could not help it well said the head i will give you my answer you have no right to expect me to send you back to kansas unless you do something for me in return in this country every one must pay for everything he gets if you wish me to use my magic power to send you home again you must do something for me first help me and i will help you what must i do asked the girl 
"'Kill the wicked witch of the West,' answered Oz. "'But I cannot,' exclaimed Dorothy, greatly surprised. "'You kill the wicked witch of the East, and you wear the silver shoes, which bear a powerful charm. There is now but one wicked witch left in all this land, and when you can tell me she is dead, I will send you back to Kansas, but not before.' The little girl began to weep. She was so much disappointed, and the eyes winked again and looked upon her anxiously, as if the great Oz felt that she could help him if she would. "'I never killed anything willingly,' she sobbed. "'Even if I wanted to, how could I kill the wicked witch? If you, who are great and terrible, cannot kill her yourself, how do you expect me to do it?' "'I do not know,' said the head. "'But that is my answer.' and until the wicked witch dies you will not see your uncle and aunt again. Remember that the witch is wicked, tremendously wicked, and ought to be killed. Now go and do not ask to see me again until you have done your task. Sorrowfully Dorothy left the throne room, and went back where the lion and the scarecrow and the tin woodman were waiting to hear what Oz had said to her. There is no hope for me, she said sadly, for Oz will not send me home until I have killed the wicked witch of the West, and that I can never do. Her friends were sorry, but could do nothing to help her, so Dorothy went to her own room and lay down on the bed and cried herself to sleep. The next morning the soldier with the green whiskers came to the scarecrow and said, Come with me, for Oz has sent for you. So the scarecrow followed him and was admitted into the great throne room, where he saw sitting in the emerald throne a most lovely lady. She was dressed in green silk gauze and wore upon her flowing green locks a crown of jewels. Growing from her shoulders were wings, gorgeous in colour and so light that they fluttered if the slightest breath of air reached them. When the scarecrow had bowed as prettily as his straw stuffing would let him before this beautiful creature, she looked upon him sweetly and said, I am Oz, the great and terrible. Who are you, and why do you seek me? Now the scarecrow, who had expected to see the great head Dorothy had told him of, was much astonished, but he answered her bravely. I am only a scarecrow stuffed with straw. Therefore I have no brains, and I come to you praying that you will put brains in my head instead of straw, so that I may become as much a man as any other in your dominions. "'Why should I do this for you?' asked the lady. "'Because you are wise and powerful, and no one else can help me,' answered the scarecrow. "'I never grant favours without some return,' said Oz. "'But this much I will promise. "'If you will kill for me the wicked witch of the West, "'I will bestow upon you a great many brains, "'and such good brains that you will be the wisest man in all the land of Oz.' "'I thought you asked Dorothy to kill the witch,' said the Scarecrow in surprise. "'So I did. I don't care who kills her, but until she is dead I will not grant your wish. Now go, and do not seek me again, until you have earned the brains you so greatly desire.' The Scarecrow went sorrowfully back to his friends, and told them what Oz had said, and Dorothy was surprised to find that the great wizard was not ahead, as she had seen him but a lovely lady. All the same, said the scarecrow, she needs a heart as much as a tin woodman. On the next morning the soldier with the green whiskers came to the tin woodman and said, Oz is sent for you, follow me. So the tin woodman followed him and came to the great throne room. He did not know whether he would find Oz a lovely lady or a head, but he hoped it would be the lovely lady. For, he said to himself, if it is the head, I am sure I shall not be given a heart, since a head has no heart of its own, and therefore cannot feel for me. But if it is the lovely lady, I shall beg hard for a heart, for all ladies are themselves said to be kindly hearted. But when the woodman entered the great throne room, he saw neither the head nor the lady, for Oz had taken the shape of a most terrible beast. It was nearly as big as an elephant, and the green throne seemed hardly strong enough to hold its weight. The beast had a head like that of a rhinoceros, only there were five eyes in its face. There were five long arms growing out of its body, and it also had five long slim legs, 
Thick woolly hair covered every part of it, and a more dreadful-looking monster could not be imagined. It was fortunate the tin woodman had no heart at that moment, for it would have beat loud and fast from terror. But being only tin, the woodman was not at all afraid, although he was much disappointed. "'I am Oz, the great and terrible,' spoke the beast, in a voice that was one great roar. "'Who are you, and why do you seek me?' "'I am a woodman, and made of tin. Therefore I have no heart, and cannot love. I pray you to give me a heart, that I may be as other men are.' "'Why should I do this?' demanded the beast. "'Because I ask it, and you alone can grant my request,' answered the woodman. Oz gave a low growl at this, but said gruffly, "'If you indeed desire a heart, you must earn it.' "'How?' asked the woodman. "'Help Dorothy to kill the wicked witch of the West,' replied the beast. "'When the witch is dead, come to me, and then I will give you the biggest and kindest and most loving heart in all the land of Oz.' So the tin woodman was forced to return sorrowfully to his friends, and tell them of the terrible beast he had seen. They all wondered greatly at the many forms the great wizard could take upon himself, and the lion said, "'If he is a beast, when I go to see him I shall roar my loudest, and so frighten him that he will grant all I ask. And if he is the lovely lady, I shall pretend to spring upon her, and so compel her to do my bidding. And if he is the great head, he will be at my mercy, for I will roll this head all about the room until he promises to give us what we desire.' So be of good cheer, my friends, for all will yet be well. The next morning the soldier with the green whiskers led the lion to the great throne room and bade him enter the presence of Oz. The lion at once passed through the door and, glancing around, saw to his surprise that before the throne was a ball of fire, so fierce and glowing, that he could scarcely bear to gaze upon it. His first thought was that Oz had by accident caught on fire and was burning up. But when he tried to go nearer, the heat was so intense that it singed his whiskers, and he crept back tremblingly to a spot nearer the door. Then a low, quiet voice came from the ball of fire, and these were the words that spoke. I am Oz, the great and terrible. Who are you, and why do you seek me? And the lion answered, I am the cowardly lion, afraid of everything. I came to you to beg that you give me courage, so that in reality I may become the king of beasts, as men call me. Why should I give you courage? demanded Oz. Because of all wizards you are the greatest, and alone have power to grant my request, answered the lion. The ball of fire burned fiercely for a time, and the voice said, Bring me proof that the wicked witch is dead, and that moment I will give you courage. But as long as the witch lives, you must remain a coward. The lion was angry at the speech, but could say nothing in reply, and while he stood silently gazing at the ball of fire, it became so furiously hot that he turned tail and rushed from the room. He was glad to find his friends waiting for him, and told them of his terrible interview with the wizard. What shall we do now? asked Dorothy sadly. There is only one thing we can do, returned the lion and that is to go to the land of the Winkies, seek out the Wicked Witch, and destroy her. But suppose we cannot, said the girl. Then I shall never have courage, declared the lion. And I shall never have brains, added the scarecrow. And I shall never have a heart, spoke the tin woodman. And I shall never see Aunt Em and Uncle Henry, said Dorothy, beginning to cry. Be careful, cried the green girl. The tears will fall upon your green silk gown and spot it. So Dorothy dried her tears and said, I suppose he must try it, but I am sure I do not want to kill anybody, even to see Aunt Em again. I will go with you, but I am too much of a coward to kill the witch, said the lion. I will go too, declared the scarecrow, but I shall not be of much help to you. I am such a fool. I haven't the heart to harm even a witch remarked the tin woodman, but if you go, I certainly shall go with you. Therefore it was decided to start upon their journey the next morning, and the woodman sharpened his axe on a green grindstone and had all his joints properly oiled. The scarecrow stuffed himself with fresh straw, and Dorothy put new paint on his eyes that he might see better. 
the green girl who was very kind to them filled dorothy's basket with good things to eat and fastened a little bell around toto's neck with a green ribbon they went to bed quite early and slept soundly until daylight when they were awakened by the crowing of a green cock that lived in the back yard of the palace and a cackling of a hen that had laid a green egg End of chapter 11「The soldier with the green whiskers led them through the streets of the Emerald City until they reached the room where the guardian of the gates lived. This officer unlocked their spectacles to put them back in his great box and then he politely opened the gate for our friends. "'Which road leads to the Wicked Witch of the West?' asked Dorothy. "'There is no road,' answered the guardian of the gates. "'No one ever wishes to go that way.' "'How then are we to find her?' inquired the girl. "'That will be easy,' replied the man, "'for when she knows you are in the country of the Winkies, she will find you and make you all her slaves.' "'Perhaps not,' said the Scarecrow, "'for we mean to destroy her.' Oh, that is different, said the guardian of the gates. No one has ever destroyed her before, so I naturally thought she would make slaves of you, as she has of all the rest. But take care, for she is wicked and fierce, and may not allow you to destroy her. Keep to the west where the sun sets, and you cannot fail to find her. They thanked him and bade him good-bye, and turned toward the west, walking over fields of soft grass dotted here and there with daisies and buttercups. Dorothy still wore the pretty silk dress she had put on in the palace, but now to her surprise she found it was no longer green, but pure white. The ribbon around Toto's neck had also lost its green colour and was as white as Dorothy's dress. The Emerald City was soon left far behind. As they advanced the ground became rougher and hillier, for there were no farms nor houses in this country of the West, and the ground was untilled. In the afternoon, the sun shone hot in their faces, for there were no trees to offer them shade, so that before night Dorothy and Toto and the lion were tired, and lay down upon the grass and fell asleep, with the woodman and the scarecrow keeping watch. Now the wicked witch of the west had but one eye, yet that was as powerful as a telescope, and could see everywhere. So as she sat in the door of her castle, she happened to look around, and saw Dorothy lying asleep with her friends all about her. They were a long distance off, but the wicked witch was angry to find them in her country, so she blew upon a silver whistle that hung around her neck. At once they came running to her, from all directions a pack of great wolves. They had long legs and fierce eyes and sharp teeth. "'Go to those people,' said the witch, "'and tear them to pieces.' "'Are you not going to make them your slaves?' asked the leader of the wolves. No, she answered, one is of tin and one of straw, one is a girl and another a lion. None of them is fit to work, so you may tear them into small pieces. Very well, said the wolf, and he dashed away at full speed, followed by the others. It was lucky the scarecrow and the woodman were wide awake and heard the wolves coming. This is my fight, said the woodman. So get behind me, and I will meet them as they come. He seized his axe, which he had made very sharp, and as the leader of the wolves came on, the tin woodman swung his arm and chopped the wolf's head from its body, so that it immediately died. As soon as he could raise his axe, another wolf came up, and he also fell under the sharp edge of the tin woodman's weapon. There were forty wolves, and forty times a wolf was killed, so that at last they all lay dead in a heap before the woodman. Then he put down his axe and sat beside the scarecrow, who said, It was a good fight, friend. They waited until Dorothy awoke the next morning. The little girl was quite frightened when she saw the great pile of shaggy wolves, but the tin woodman told her all. She thanked him for saving them and sat down to breakfast, after which they started again upon their journey. Now the same morning the wicked witch came to the door of her castle and looked out with her one eye that could see afar off. 
she saw all her wolves lying dead and the strangers still travelling through her country this made her angrier than before and she blew her silver whistle twice straight away a great flock of wild crows came flying toward her enough to darken the sky and the wicked witch said to the king crow fly at once to the strangers peck out their eyes and tear them to pieces the wild crows flew in one great flock toward dorothy and her companions when the little girl saw them coming she was afraid but the scarecrow said this is my battle so lie down beside me and you will not be harmed so they all lay upon the ground except the scarecrow and he stood up and stretched out his arms and when the crows saw him they were frightened as these birds always are by scarecrows and did not dare to come any nearer but the king crow said it is only a stuffed man i will peck his eyes out the king crow flew at the scarecrow who caught it by the head and twisted its neck until it died and then another crow flew at him and the scarecrow twisted its neck also there were forty crows and forty times the scarecrow twisted a neck until at last all were lying dead beside him then he called to his companions to rise and again they went upon their journey when the wicked witch looked out again and saw all her crows lying in a heap she got into a terrible rage and blew three times upon her silver whistle forthwith there was heard a great buzzing in the air and a swarm of black bees came flying towards her go to the strangers and sting them to death commanded the witch and the bees turned and flew rapidly until they came to where dorothy and her friends were walking but the woodman had seen them coming and the scarecrow had decided what to do take out my straw and scatter it over the little girl and the dog and the lion he said to the woodman and the bees cannot sting them this the woodman did and as dorothy lay close beside the lion and held toto in her arms the straw covered them entirely the bees came and found no one but the woodman to sting so they flew at him and broke off all their stings against the tin without hurting the woodman at all and as bees cannot live when their stings are broken that was the end of the black bees and they lay scattered thick about the woodman like little heaps of fine coal then dorothy and the lion got up and the girl helped the tin woodman put the straw back into the scarecrow again until he was as good as ever so they started upon their journey once more the wicked witch was so angry when she saw her black bees in little heaps like fine coal that she stamped her foot and tore her hair and gnashed her teeth and then she called a dozen of her slaves who were the winkies and gave them sharp spears telling them to go to the strangers and destroy them the winkies were not a brave people but they had to do as they were told so they marched away until they came near to dorothy then the lion gave a great roar and sprang toward them and the poor winkies were so frightened that they ran back as fast as they could when they returned to the castle the wicked witch beat them well with a strap and sent them back to their work after which she sat down to think about what she should do next she could not understand how all her plans to destroy these strangers had failed but she was a powerful witch as well as a wicked one and she soon made up her mind how to act there was in her cupboard a golden cap with a circle of diamonds and rubies running round it this golden cap had a charm whoever owned it could call three times upon the winged monkeys who would obey any order they were given but no person could command these strange creatures more than three times twice already the wicked witch had used the charm of the cap once was when she had made the winkies her slaves and set herself to rule over their country the winged monkeys had helped her do this the second time was when she had fought against the great oz himself and driven him out of the land of the west the winged monkeys had also helped her in doing this only once more could she use this golden cap for which reason she did not like to do so until all her other powers were exhausted but now that her fierce wolves and her wild crows and her stinging bees were gone and her slaves had been scared away by the cowardly lion she saw there was only one way left to destroy dorothy and her friends so the wicked witch took the golden cap from her cupboard and placed it upon her head then she stood upon her left foot and said slowly Eppy, peppy, kaki. 
Next she stood upon her right foot and said, Hello, hollo, hello. After that she stood upon both feet and cried in a loud voice, Zizzy, zizzy, zick. Now the charm began to work. The sky was darkened, and a low rumbling sound was heard in the air. There was a rushing of many wings, a great chattering and laughing, and the sun came out of the dark sky to show the wicked witch surrounded by a crowd of monkeys, each with a pair of immense and powerful wings on his shoulders. One, much bigger than the others, seemed to be their leader. He flew close to the witch and said, You have called us for the third and last time. What do you command? Go to the strangers who are within my land and destroy them all except the lion, said the wicked witch. Bring that beast to me, for I have a mind to harness him like a horse and make him work. Your command shall be obeyed, said the leader. And then, with a great deal of chattering and noise, the winged monkeys flew away to the place where Dorothy and her friends were walking. Some of the monkeys seized the tin woodman and carried him through the air until they were over a country thickly covered with sharp rocks. Here they dropped the poor woodman, who fell a great distance to the rocks, where he lay so battered and dented that he could neither move nor groan. Others of the monkeys caught the scarecrow and with their long fingers pulled all of the straw out of his clothes and head. They made his hat and boots and clothes into a small bundle and threw it into the top branches of a tall tree. The remaining monkeys threw pieces of stout rope around the lion and wound many coils about his body and head and legs until he was unable to bite or scratch or struggle in any way. Then they lifted him up and flew away with him to the witch's castle where he was placed in a small yard with a high iron fence around it so that he could not escape. But Dorothy they did not harm at all. She stood with Toto in her arms, watching the sad fate of her comrades and thinking it would soon be her turn. The leader of the winged monkeys flew up to her, his long hairy arms stretched out and his ugly face grinning terribly. But he saw the mark of the good witch's kiss upon her forehead and stopped short, motioning the others not to touch her. We dare not harm this little girl, he said to them, for she is protected by the power of good, and that is greater than the power of evil. All we can do is to carry her to the castle of the wicked witch and leave her there. So carefully and gently they lifted Dorothy in their arms and carried her swiftly through the air until they came to the castle, where they set her down upon the front doorstep. Then the leader said to the witch, We have obeyed you as far as we were able. The tin woodman and the scarecrow are destroyed and the lion is tied up in your yard. The little girl we dare not harm, nor the dog she carries in her arms. Your power over our band is now ended, and you will never see us again. Then all the winged monkeys, with much laughing and chattering and noise, flew into the air and were soon out of sight. The wicked witch was both surprised and worried when she saw the mark on Dorothy's forehead for she knew well that neither the winged monkeys nor she herself dared hurt the girl in any way. She looked down at Dorothy's feet and, seeing the silver shoes, began to tremble with fear, for she knew what a powerful charm belonged to them. At first the witch was tempted to run away from Dorothy, but she happened to look into the child's eyes and saw how simple the soul behind them was, and that the little girl did not know of the wonderful power the silver shoes gave her. So the wicked witch laughed to herself and thought, I can still make her my slave, for she does not know how to use her power. Then she said to Dorothy, harshly and severely, Come with me and see that you mind everything I tell you, for if you do not, I will make an end of you, as I did of the tin woodman and the scarecrow. Dorothy followed her through many of the beautiful rooms in her castle, until they came to the kitchen where the witch bade her clean the pots and kettles and sweep the floor and keep the fire fed with wood. Dorothy went to work meekly with her mind made up to work as hard as she could, for she was glad the wicked witch had decided not to kill her. With Dorothy hard at work, the witch thought she would go into the courtyard and harness the cowardly lion like a horse. It would amuse her, she was sure, to make him draw her chariot whenever she wished to go to drive. But as she opened the gate, the lion gave a loud roar and bounded at her so fiercely that the witch was afraid and ran out and shut the gate again. 
if i cannot harness you said the witch to the lion speaking through the bars of the gate i can starve you you shall have nothing to eat until you do as i wish so after that she took no food to the imprisoned lion but every day she came to the gate at noon and asked are you ready to be harnessed like a horse and the lion would answer no if you come in this yard i will bite you the reason the lion did not have to do as the witch wished was that every night while the woman was asleep dorothy carried him food from the cupboard after he had eaten he would lie down on his bed of straw and dorothy would lie beside him and put her head on his soft shaggy mane while they talked of their troubles and tried to plan some way to escape. But they could find no way to get out of the castle, for it was constantly guarded by the yellow Winkies, who were the slaves of the wicked witch, and too afraid of her not to do as she told them. The girl had to work hard during the day, and often the witch threatened to beat her with the same old umbrella she always carried in her hand. But in truth, she did not dare to strike Dorothy because of the mark upon her forehead. The child did not know this, and was full of fear for herself and Toto. Once the witch struck Toto a blow with her umbrella, and the brave little dog flew at her and bit her leg in return. The witch did not bleed where she was bitten, for she was so wicked that the blood in her had dried up many years before. Dorothy's life became very sad, as she grew to understand that it would be harder than ever to get back to Kansas and Aunt Em again. Sometimes she would cry bitterly for hours, with Toto sitting at her feet and looking into her face, whining dismally to show how sorry he was for his little mistress. Toto did not really care whether he was in Kansas or the land of Oz, so long as Dorothy was with him, but he knew the little girl was unhappy, and that made him unhappy too. Now the wicked witch had a great longing to have for her own the silver shoes which the girl always wore. Her bees and her crows and her wolves were lying in heaps and drying up, and she had used up all the power of the golden cap. But if she could only get hold of the silver shoes, they would give her more power than all the other things she had lost. She watched Dorothy carefully to see if she ever took off her shoes, thinking she might steal them. But the child was so proud of her pretty shoes that she never took them off except at night and when she took her bath. The witch was too much afraid of the dog to dare go in Dorothy's room at night to take the shoes, and her dread of water was greater than her fear of the dark, so she never came near when Dorothy was bathing. Indeed, the old witch never touched water, nor ever let water touch her in any way. But the wicked creature was very cunning, and she finally thought of a trick that would give her what she wanted. She had placed a bar of iron in the middle of the kitchen floor and then by her magic arts made the iron invisible to human eyes, so that when Dorothy walked across the floor she stumbled over the bar, not being able to see it, and fell at full length. She was not much hurt, but in her fall one of the silver shoes came off, and before she could reach it the witch had snatched it away and put it on her own skinny foot. The wicked woman was greatly pleased with the success of her trick, for as long as she had one of the shoes she owned half the power of their charm, and Dorothy could not use it against her, even had she known how to do so. The little girl, seeing that she had lost one of her pretty shoes, grew angry and said to the witch, Give me back my shoe! I will not, retorted the witch, for it is now my shoe and not yours. You are a wicked creature, cried Dorothy. You have no right to take my shoe from me. I shall keep it just the same, said the witch, laughing at her, and some day I shall get the other one from you too. This made Dorothy so very angry that she picked up the bucket of water that stood near and dashed it over the witch, wetting her from head to foot. Instantly the wicked woman gave a loud cry of fear, and then, as Dorothy looked at her in wonder, the witch began to shrink and fall away. See what you've done! she screamed. In a minute I shall melt away. I'm very sorry indeed, said Dorothy, who was truly frightened, to see the witch actually melting away like brown sugar before her very eyes. Didn't you know water would be the end of me? asked the witch in a wailing, despairing voice. Of course not, answered Dorothy. How should I? Well, in a few minutes I shall be all melted, and you will have the castle to yourself. I have been wicked in my day, 
but I never thought a little girl like you would ever be able to melt me and in my wicked deeds. Look out! Here I go! With these words, the witch fell down in a brown melted shapeless mass and began to spread over the clean boards of the kitchen floor. Seeing that she had really melted away to nothing, Dorothy drew another bucket of water and threw it over the mess. Then she swept it all out the door after picking out the silver shoe, which was all that was left of the old woman. She cleaned and dried it with a cloth and put it on her foot again. Then, being at last free to do as she chose, she ran out into the courtyard to tell the lion that the wicked witch of the west had come to an end and that they were no longer prisoners in a strange land. End of chapter 12「Chapter Thirteen of the Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Stanley. The Rescue The cowardly lion was much pleased to hear that the wicked witch had been melted by a bucket of water, and Dorothy at once unlocked the gate of his prison and set him free. They went in together to the castle where Dorothy's first act was to call all the Winkies together and tell them that they were no longer slaves. There was great rejoicing among the yellow winkies, for they had been made to work hard during many years for the wicked witch, who had always treated them with great cruelty. They kept this day as a holiday, then and ever after, and spent the time in feasting and dancing. "'If our friends the Scarecrow and the Tin Woodman were only with us,' said the lion, "'I should be quite happy.' "'Don't you suppose we could rescue them?' asked the girl anxiously. We can try, answered the lion. So they called the yellow winkies and asked them if they would help to rescue their friends, and the winkies said that they would be delighted to do all in their power for Dorothy, who had set them free from bondage. So she chose a number of the winkies, who looked as if they knew the most, and they all started away. They travelled that day and part of the next, until they came to the rocky plain, where the tin woodman lay, all battered and bent. His axe was near him, but the blade was rusted and the handle broken off short. The Winkies lifted him tenderly in their arms and carried him back to the yellow castle again, Dorothy shedding a few tears by the way at the sad plight of her old friend, and the lion looking sober and sorry. When they reached the castle, Dorothy said to the Winkies, "'Are any of your people tinsmiths?' "'Oh, yes, some of us are very good tinsmiths,' they told her. Then bring them to me, she said. And when the tinsmiths came, bringing with them all their tools in baskets, she inquired, Can you straighten out those dents in the tin woodman and bend him back into shape again and solder him together where he is broken? The tinsmiths looked the woodman over carefully and then answered that they thought they could mend him, so he would be as good as ever. So they set to work in one of the big yellow rooms of the castle and worked for three days and four nights hammering and twisting and bending and soldering and polishing and pounding at the legs and body and head of the tin woodman until at last he was straightened out into his old form and his joints worked as well as ever to be sure there were several patches on him but the tinsmiths did a good job and as the woodman was not a vain man he did not mind the patches at all when at last he walked into dorothy's room and thanked her for rescuing him he was so pleased that he wept tears of joy, and Dorothy had to wipe every tear carefully from his face with her apron, so his joints would not be rusted. At the same time, her own tears fell thick and fast at the joy of meeting her old friend again, and these tears did not need to be wiped away. As for the lion, he wiped his eyes so often with the tip of his tail that it became quite wet, and he was obliged to go out into the courtyard and hold it in the sun till it dried. "'If only we had the scarecrow with us again,' said the tin woodman, when Dorothy had finished telling him everything that had happened, "'I should be quite happy.' "'We must try to find him,' said the girl. So she called the Winkies to help her, and they walked all that day and part of the next, until they came to the tall tree in the branches of which the winged monkeys had tossed the scarecrow's clothes. It was a very tall tree, and the trunk was so smooth that no one could climb it. But the woodman said at once, I'll chop it down, and then we can get the scarecrow's clothes. 
Now, while the tinsmiths had been at work mending the woodman himself, another of the winkies, who was a goldsmith, had made an axe handle of solid gold and fitted it to the woodman's axe instead of the old broken handle. Others polished the blade until all the rust was removed and it glistened like burnished silver. As soon as he had spoken, the tin woodman began to chop, and in a short time the tree fell over with a crash, when the scarecrow's clothes fell out of the branches and rolled off on the ground. Dorothy picked them up and had the Winkies carry them back to the castle, where they were stuffed with nice clean straw. And behold, here was the scarecrow, as good as ever, thanking them over and over again for saving him. Now they were reunited, Dorothy and her friends spent a few happy days at the Yellow Castle, where they found everything they needed to make them comfortable. But one day the girl thought of Aunt Em and said, We must go back to Oz and claim his promise. Yes, said the woodman, at last I shall get my heart. And I shall get my brains, added the scarecrow joyfully. And I shall get my courage, said the lion thoughtfully. And I shall get back to Kansas, cried Dorothy, clapping her hands. Oh, let us start for the Emerald City tomorrow. This they decided to do. The next day they called the Winkies together and bade them goodbye. The Winkies were sorry to have them go, and they had grown so fond of the Tin Woodman that they begged him to stay and rule over them and the Yellow Land of the West. Finding they were determined to go, the Winkies gave Toto and the Lion each a golden collar, and to Dorothy they presented a beautiful bracelet studded with diamonds, and to the Scarecrow they gave a gold-headed walking stick to keep him from stumbling and to the tin woodman they offered a silver oil can inlaid with gold and set with precious jewels every one of the travellers made the winkies a pretty speech in return and all shook hands with them until their arms ached dorothy went to the witch's cupboard to fill her basket with food for the journey and there she saw the golden cap she tried it on her own head and found that it fitted her exactly she did not know anything about the charm of the golden cap but she saw that it was pretty, so she made up her mind to wear it and carry her sunbonnet in the basket. Then, being prepared for the journey, they all started for the Emerald City, and the Winkies gave them three cheers and many good wishes to carry with them. End of chapter 13、Chapter、14 of The Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Stanley. The Winged Monkeys. You will remember there was no road, not even a pathway between the castle of the Wicked Witch and the Emerald City. When the four travellers went in search of the witch, she had seen them coming, and so sent the winged monkeys to bring them to her. It was much harder to find their way back through the big fields of buttercups. And yellow daisies than it was being carried. They knew, of course, they must go straight east toward the rising sun, and they started off in the right way. But at noon, when the sun was over their heads, they did not know which was east, which was west, and that was the reason they got lost in the great fields. They kept on walking, however, and at night the moon came out and shone brightly, so they lay down among the sweet smelling yellow flowers and slept soundly until morning. All but the scarecrow and the tin woodman. The next morning the sun was behind a cloud, but they started on as if they were quite sure which way they were going. If we walk far enough, said Dorothy, we shall some time come to some place, I'm sure. But day by day passed away, and they still saw nothing before them but the yellow fields. The scarecrow began to grumble a bit. We have surely lost our way, he said. And unless we find it again in time to reach the Emerald City, I shall never get my brains. Nor I my heart, declared the Tin Woodman. It seems to me I can scarcely wait till I get to Oz, and you must admit this is a very long journey. You see, said the Cowardly Lion with a whimper, I haven't the courage to keep tramping forever without getting anywhere at all. Then Dorothy lost heart. She sat down on the grass and looked at her companions, and they sat down and looked at her, and Toto found that for the first time in his life he was too tired to chase a butterfly that flew past his head. So he put out his tongue and panted and looked at Dorothy, 
as if to ask what they should do next. Suppose we call the field mice, she suggested. They could probably tell us the way to the Emerald City. To be sure they could, cried the scarecrow. Why didn't we think of that before? Dorothy blew the little whistle she had always carried about her neck since the queen of the mice had given it to her. In a few minutes they heard the pattering of tiny feet, and many of the small grey mice came running up to her. Among them was the queen herself, who asked in her squeaky little voice, "'What can I do for my friends?' "'We have lost our way,' said Dorothy. "'Can you tell us where the Emerald City is?' "'Certainly,' answered the queen. "'But it is a great way off, for you have had it at your backs all this time.' Then she noticed Dorothy's golden cap and said, "'Why don't you use the charm of the cap and call the winged monkeys to you? "'They will carry you to the city of Oz in less than an hour.' "'I didn't know there was a charm,' answered Dorothy in surprise. "'What is it?' "'It is written inside the golden cap,' replied the queen of the mice. "'But if you are going to call the winged monkeys, we must run away, "'for they are full of mischief and think it great fun to plague us.' "'Won't they hurt me?' asked the girl anxiously. "'Oh, no, they must obey the wearer of the cap. "'Good-bye.' "'And she scampered out of sight with all the mice hurrying after her. Dorothy looked inside the golden cap and saw some words written upon the lining. These she thought must be the charm, so she read the directions carefully and put the cap upon her head. Eppy, Peppy, Kaki, she said, standing on her left foot. What did you say? asked the scarecrow, who did not know what she was doing. Hello, 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 Dorothy went on, standing this time on her right foot. Hello? replied the tin woodman calmly. Zizzy, zazzy, zick, said Dorothy, who was now standing on both feet. This ended the saying of the charm, and they heard a great chattering and flapping of wings, as the band of winged monkeys flew up to them. The king bowed low before Dorothy and asked, What is your command? We wish to go to the Emerald City, said the child, and we have lost our way. We will carry you, replied the king, and no sooner had he spoken then two of the monkeys caught Dorothy in their arms and flew away with her. Others took the scarecrow and the woodman and the lion, and one little monkey seized Toto and flew after them, although the dog tried hard to bite him. The scarecrow and the tin woodman were rather frightened at first, for they remembered how badly the winged monkeys had treated them before. But they saw that no harm was intended, so they rode through the air quite cheerfully and had a fine time looking at the pretty gardens and woods far below them. Dorothy found herself riding easily between two of the biggest monkeys, one of them the king himself. They had made a chair of their hands and were careful not to hurt her. "'Why do you have to obey the charm of the golden cap?' she asked. "'That is a long story,' answered the king with a laugh. "'But as we have a long journey before us, I will pass the time by telling you about it, if you wish.' "'I shall be glad to hear it,' she replied. Once, began the leader, we were a free people, living happily in the great forest, flying from tree to tree, eating nuts and fruit, and doing just as we pleased without calling anybody master. Perhaps some of us were rather too full of mischief at times, flying down to pull the tails of the animals that had no wings, chasing birds, and throwing nuts at people who walked in the forest. But we were careless and happy and full of fun, and enjoyed every minute of the day. This was many years ago, long before Oz came out of the clouds to rule over this land. There lived here then, away at the north, a beautiful princess, who was also a powerful sorceress. All her magic was used to help the people, and she was never known to hurt anyone who was good. Her name was Galette, and she lived in a handsome palace built from great blocks of ruby. Everybody loved her but her greatest sorrow was that she could find no one to love in return, since all the men were much too stupid and ugly to mate with one so beautiful and wise. At last, however, she found a boy who was handsome and manly and wise beyond his years. Galette made up her mind that when he grew to be a man, she would make him her husband. So she took him to her ruby palace and used all her magic powers to make him as strong and good and lovely as any woman could wish. When he grew to manhood... Kalala, as he was called, was said to be the best and wisest man in all the land. While his manly beauty was so great 
that Gaylette loved him dearly and hastened to make everything ready for the wedding. My grandfather was at the time the king of the winged monkeys, which lived in the forest near Gaylette's palace, and the old fellow loved a joke better than a good dinner. One day, just before the wedding, my grandfather was flying out with his band when he saw Quilala walking beside the river. He was dressed in a rich costume of pink silk and purple velvet, and my grandfather thought he would see what he could do. At his word, the band flew down and seized Quilala, carried him in their arms until they were over the middle of the river, and then dropped him into the water. "'Swim out, my fine fellow,' cried my grandfather, "'and see if the water has spotted your clothes.' Quilala was much too wise not to swim, and he was not in the least spoiled by all his good fortune. He laughed when he came to the top of the water and swam him to shore, but when Gaylette came running out to him, she found his silks and velvet all ruined by the river. The princess was very angry, and she knew of course who did it. She had all the winged monkeys brought before her, and she said at first that their wings should be tied, and they should be treated as they had treated Kalala and dropped in the river. But my grandfather pleaded hard, for he knew the monkeys would drown in the river with their wings tied, and Kalala said a kind word for them also. So that Gaylette finally spared them, on condition that the winged monkeys should ever after do three times the bidding of the owner of the golden cap. This cap had been made for a wedding present to Kalala, and it is said to have cost the princess half her kingdom. Of course, my grandfather and all the other monkeys at once agreed to the condition, and that is how it happens that we are three times the slaves of the owner of the golden cap, whomsoever he may be. And what became of them? asked Dorothy, who had been greatly interested in the story. Kualala being the first owner of the golden cap, replied the monkey, he was the first to lay his wishes upon us. As his bride could not bear the sight of us, he called us all to him in the forest after he had married her, and ordered us to always keep where she could never set eyes on a winged monkey, which we were glad to do, for we were all afraid of her. This was all we ever had to do until the golden cap fell into the hands of the wicked witch of the West, who made us enslave the Winkies, and afterward drive Oz himself out of the land of the West. Now the golden cap is yours, and three times you have the right to lay your wishes upon us. As the Monkey King finished his story, Dorothy looked down and saw the green shining walls of the Emerald City before them. She wondered at the rapid flight of the monkeys, but was glad the journey was over. The strange creatures set the travellers down carefully before the gate of the city. The king bowed low to Dorothy, and then flew swiftly away, followed by all his band. "'That was a good ride,' said the little girl. "'Yes, and a quick way out of our troubles,' replied the lion. "'How lucky it was you brought away that wonderful cap!' End of chapter 14「Fifteen of the Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Stanley. The Discovery of Oz the Terrible. The four travellers walked up to the great gate of the Emerald City and rang the bell. After ringing several times, it was opened by the same guardian of the gate they had met before. What? Are you back again? he asked in surprise. Do you not see us? answered the scarecrow. But I thought you had gone to visit the wicked witch of the West. We did visit her, said the scarecrow. And she let you go again? asked the man in wonder. She could not help it, for she is melted, explained the scarecrow. Melted? Well, that is good news indeed, said the man. Who melted her? It was Dorothy, said the lion gravely. Good gracious, exclaimed the man and he bowed very low indeed before her. Then he led them into his little room, and locked the spectacles from the great box on all their eyes, just as he had done before. Afterward they passed on through the gate into the Emerald City, and when the people heard from the guardian of the gate that they had melted the wicked witch of the West, they all gathered around the travellers, and followed them in a great crowd to the Palace of Oz. The soldier with the green whiskers was still on guard before the door, but he let them in at once, and they were again met by the beautiful green girl, who showed each of them to their old rooms at once, 
so they might rest until the great Oz was ready to receive them. The soldier had the news carried straight to Oz that Dorothy and the other travellers had come back again, after destroying the wicked witch. But Oz made no reply. They thought the great wizard would send for them at once, but he did not. They had no word from him the next day, nor the next, nor the next. The waiting was tiresome and wearing, and at last they grew vexed that Oz should treat them in so poor a fashion, after sending them to undergo hardships and slavery. So the scarecrow at last asked the green girl to take another message to Oz, saying if they did not let them in to see him at once, they would call the winged monkeys to help them, and find out whether he kept his promises or not. When the wizard was given this message, he was so frightened that he sent word for them to come to the throne room at four minutes after nine o'clock the next morning. He had once met the winged monkeys in the land of the west, and did not wish to meet them again. The four travellers passed a sleepless night, each thinking of the gift Oz had promised to bestow upon him. Dorothy fell asleep only once, and then she dreamed she was in Kansas, where Aunt Em was telling her how glad she was to have her little girl at home again. Promptly at nine o'clock the next morning, the green-whiskered soldier came to them, and four minutes later they all went into the throne room of the great Oz. Of course, each one of them expected to see the wizard in the shape he had taken before, and all were greatly surprised when they looked about and saw no one at all in the room. They kept close to the door, and closer to one another, for the stillness of the empty room was more dreadful than any of the forms they had seen Oz take. Presently they heard a voice, seeming to come from somewhere near the top of the great dome, and it said solemnly, I am Oz! the great and terrible why do you seek me they looked again in every part of the room and then seeing no one dorothy asked where are you i am everywhere answered the voice but to the eyes of common mortals i am invisible i will now seat myself upon my throne that you may converse with me indeed the voice seemed just then to come straight from the throne itself so they walked toward it and stood in a row while Dorothy said, "'We have come to claim our promise, O oh Oz.' "'What promise?' asked Oz. "'You promised to send me back to Kansas when the Wicked Witch was destroyed,' said the girl. "'And you promised to give me brains,' said the Scarecrow. "'And you promised to give me a heart,' said the Tin Woodman. "'And you promised to give me courage,' said the Cowardly Lion." "'Is the Wicked Witch really destroyed?' asked the voice, and Dorothy thought it trembled a little. "'Yes,' she answered. "'I melted to her with a bucket of water.' "'Dear me,' said the voice, "'how sudden! Well, come to me tomorrow, for I must have time to think it over.' "'You've had plenty of time already,' said the Tin Woodman, angrily. "'We shan't wait a day longer,' said the Scarecrow. "'You must keep your promises to us,' exclaimed Dorothy. The lion thought it might be as well to frighten the wizard, so he gave a large, loud roar, which was so fierce and dreadful that Toto jumped away from him in alarm and tipped over the screen that stood in a corner. As it fell with a crash, they looked that way, and the next moment all of them were filled with wonder, for they saw, standing in just the spot the screen had hidden, a little old man with a bald head and a wrinkled face, you seemed to be as much surprised as they were. The tin woodman, raising his axe, rushed towards the little man and cried out, Who are you? I am Oz the Great and Terrible, said the little man in a trembling voice. But don't strike me, please don't, and I'll do anything you want me to. Our friends looked at him in surprise and dismay. I thought Oz was a great head, said Dorothy. And I thought Oz was a lovely lady said the scarecrow and i thought oz was a terrible beast said the tin woodman and i thought oz was a ball of fire exclaimed the lion no you're all wrong said the little man meekly i have been making believe making believe cried dorothy are you not a great wizard hush my dear he said don't speak so loud or you will be overheard and i should be ruined i am supposed to be a great wizard and aren't you she asked not a bit of it my dear i'm just a common man 
you're more than that said the scarecrow in a grieved tone you're a humbug exactly so declared the little man rubbing his hands together as if it pleased him i am a humbug but this is terrible said the tin woodman how shall i ever get my heart or oh, i my courage asked the lion or oh, i my brains wailed the scarecrow wiping the tears from his eyes with his coat sleeve my dear friends said oz i pray you not to speak of these little things think of me and the terrible trouble i am in at being found out doesn't any one else know you are humbug asked dorothy no one knows it but you four and myself replied oz i have fooled every one for so long that i thought i should never be found out it was a great mistake my ever letting you into the throne room usually i will not see even my subjects and so they believe i am something terrible but i don't understand said dorothy in bewilderment how was it that you appeared to me as a great head that was one of my tricks answered oz step this way please and i will tell you all about it he led the way to a small chamber in the rear of the throne room and they all followed him he pointed to one corner in which lay the great head made out of many thicknesses of paper and with a carefully painted face this i hung from the ceiling by a wire said oz i stood behind the screen and pulled a thread to make the eyes move and the mouth open but how about the voice she inquired oh i'm a ventriloquist said the little man and i can throw the sound of my voice wherever i wish so that you thought it was coming out of the head here are the other things i used to deceive you he showed the scarecrow the dress and the mask he had worn when he seemed to be the lovely lady and the tin woodman saw that his terrible beast was nothing but a lot of skin sewn together with slats to keep their sides out as for the ball of fire the false wizard had hung that also from the ceiling it was really a ball of cotton but when oil was poured upon it the ball burned fiercely really said the scarecrow you ought to be ashamed of yourself for being such a humbug i am i certainly am answered the little man sorrowfully but it was the only thing i could do sit down please there are plenty of chairs and i will tell you my story so they sat down and listened while he told the following tale i was born in omaha why that isn't very far from kansas cried dorothy no but it's farther from here he said shaking his head at her sadly when i grew up i became a ventriloquist and at that i was very well trained by a great master i can imitate any kind of bird or beast here he mewed so like a kitten that toto pricked up his ears and looked everywhere to see where she was after a time continued oz i tired of that and became a balloonist what is that asked dorothy a man who goes up in a balloon on circus day so as to draw a crowd of people together and get them to pay to see the circus he explained oh she said i know well one day i went up in a balloon and the ropes got twisted so that i couldn't come down again it went way up above the clouds so far that a current of air struck it and carried it many many miles away for a day and a night i travelled through the air and on the morning of the second day i awoke and found the balloon floating over a strange and beautiful country it came down gradually and i was not hurt a bit but i found myself in the midst of a strange people who seeing me come from the clouds thought i was a great wizard of course i let them think so because they were afraid of me and promised to do anything i wished them to just to amuse myself and keep the good people busy i ordered them to build the city and my palace and they did it all willingly and well then i thought as the country was so green and beautiful i would call it the emerald city and to make the name fit better i put green spectacles on all the people so that everything they saw was green but isn't everything here green asked dorothy no more than any other city replied oz but when you wear green spectacles why of course everything you see looks green to you the emerald city was built a great many years ago for i was a young man when the balloon brought me here and i am a very old man now 
but my people have worn green glasses on their eyes so long that most of them think it really is an emerald city and it certainly is a beautiful place abounding in jewels and precious metals and every good thing that is needed to make one happy i have been good to the people and they like me but ever since this palace was built i have shut myself up and would not see any of them one of my greatest fears was the witches for while i had no magical powers at all i soon found out that the witches were really able to do wonderful things there were four of them in this country and they rule the people who live in the north and south and east and west fortunately the witches of the north and south were good and i knew they would do me no harm but the witches of the east and the west were terribly wicked and had they not thought i was more powerful than they themselves they would surely have destroyed me as it was i lived in deadly fear of them for many years so you can imagine how pleased i was when i heard your house had fallen on the wicked witch of the east when you came to me i was willing to promise anything if you would only do away with the other witch but now that you have melted her i am ashamed to say that i cannot keep my promises i think you are a very bad man said dorothy oh no my dear i am really a very good man but i am a very bad wizard i must admit can't you give me brains asked the scarecrow you don't need them you are learning something every day a baby has brains but it doesn't know much experience is the only thing that brings knowledge and the longer you are here on earth the more experience you're sure to get that may all be true said the scarecrow but i shall be very unhappy unless you give me brains the false wizard looked at him carefully well he said with a sigh i'm not much of a magician as i said but if you will come to me tomorrow morning i will stuff your head with brains i cannot tell you how to use them however you must find that out for yourself oh thank you thank you cried the scarecrow i'll find a way to use them never fear but how about my courage asked the lion anxiously you have plenty of courage i'm sure answered oz all you need is confidence in yourself there is no living thing that is not afraid when it faces danger true courage is in facing danger when you are afraid and that kind of courage you have in plenty perhaps i have but i am scared just the same said the lion i shall really be very unhappy unless you give me the sort of courage that makes one forget he's afraid very well i will give you that sort of courage to-morrow replied oz how about my heart asked the tin woodman why as for that answered oz i think you are wrong to want a heart it makes most people unhappy if only you knew it you are in luck not to have a heart that must be a matter of opinion said the tin woodman for my part i will bear all the unhappiness without a murmur if you will give me the heart very well answered oz meekly come to me to-morrow and you shall have a heart i have played wizard for so many years that i may as well continue the part a little longer and now said dorothy how am i to get back to kansas we shall have to think about that replied the little man give me two or three days to consider the matter and i'll try and find a way to carry you over the desert in the meantime you shall all be treated as my guests and while you live in the palace my people will wait upon you and obey your slightest wish there is only one thing i ask in return for my help such as it is you must keep my secret and tell no one i am a humbug they agreed to say nothing of what they had learned and went back to their rooms in high spirits even dorothy had hope that the great and terrible humbug as she called him would find a way to send her back to kansas and if he did that she was willing to forgive him everything end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of the wonderful wizard of oz by l frank baum this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn stanley the magic art of the great humbug next morning the scarecrow said to his friends congratulate me i'm going to oz to get my brains at last when i return i shall be as other men are 
I have always liked you as you were, said Dorothy simply. It is kind of you to like a scarecrow, he replied. But surely you will think more of me when you hear the splendid thoughts my new brain is going to turn out. Then he said goodbye to them all in a cheerful voice and went to the throne room where he rapped upon the door. Come in, said Oz. The scarecrow went in and found the little man sitting down by the window, engaged in deep thought. I have come for my brains, remarked the scarecrow a little uneasily. Oh, yes, uh, sit down in that chair, please, replied Oz. You must excuse me for taking your head off, but I shall have to do it in order to put your brains in their proper place. That's all right, said the scarecrow. You are quite welcome to take my head off, as long as it will be a better one when you put it on again. So the wizard unfastened his head and emptied out the straw. Then he entered the back room and took up a measure of bran, which he mixed with a great many pins and needles. Having shaken them together thoroughly, he filled the top of the scarecrow's head with the mixture and stuffed the rest of the space with straw to hold it in place. When he had fastened the scarecrow's head on his body again, he said to him, Hereafter you will be a great man, for I have given you a lot of brand new brains. The scarecrow was both pleased and proud at the fulfillment of his greatest wish, and having thanked Oz warmly, he went back to his friends. Dorothy looked at him curiously. His head was quite bulging out at the top with brains. How do you feel? she asked. I feel wise indeed, he answered earnestly. When I get used to my brains, I shall know everything. Why are those needles and pins sticking out of your head? asked the tin woodman. That is proof that he is sharp, remarked the lion. Well, I must go to Oz and get my heart, said the woodman. So he walked to the throne room and knocked at the door. Come in, called Oz, and the woodman entered and said, I have come for my heart. Very well, answered the little man, but I shall have to cut a hole in your breast, so I can put your heart in the right place. I hope it won't hurt you. Oh, no, answered the woodman. I shall not feel it at all. So Oz bought a pair of tinner's shears and cut a small square hole in the left side of the tin woodman's breast. Then, going to a chest of drawers, he took out a pretty heart, made entirely of silk and stuffed with sawdust. Isn't it a beauty? he asked. It is indeed, replied the woodman, who was greatly pleased. But is it a kind heart? Oh, very, answered Oz. He put the heart in the woodman's breast, and then replaced the square of tin, soldering it neatly together where it had been cut. There, said he, now you have a heart that any man might be proud of. I'm sorry I had to put a patch on your breast, but it really couldn't be helped. Never mind the patch, exclaimed the happy woodman. I am very grateful to you, and shall never forget your kindness. Don't speak of it replied Oz. Then the tin woodman went back to his friends, who wished him every joy on account of his good fortune. The lion now walked to the throne room and knocked at the door. Come in, said Oz. I have come for my courage, announced the lion, entering the room. Very well, answered the little man. I will get it for you. He went to a cupboard and reaching up to a high shelf, took down a square green bottle, the contents of which he poured into a green gold dish, beautifully carved. Placing this before the cowardly lion who sniffed at it as if he did not like it, the wizard said, Drink. What is it? asked the lion. Well, answered Oz, if it were inside of you, it would be courage. You know, of course, that courage is always inside one so that this really cannot be called courage until you have swallowed it. Therefore, I advise you to drink it as soon as possible. The lion hesitated no longer, but drank till the dish was empty. How do you feel now? asked Oz. Full of courage, replied the lion, who went joyfully back to his friends to tell them of his good fortune. Oz, left to himself, smiled to think of his success, in giving the scarecrow and the tin woodman and the lion exactly what they thought they wanted. How can I help being a humbug, he said, when all these people make me do things that everybody knows can't be done. It was easy to make the scarecrow and the lion and the woodman happy, because they imagined I could do anything. 
that it will take more than imagination to carry Dorothy back to Kansas, and I'm sure I don't know how it can be done. End of chapter 16「Chapter Seventeen of the Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Stanley. How the balloon was launched. For three days Dorothy heard nothing from Oz. These were sad days for the little girl, although her friends were all quite happy and contented. The scarecrow told them there were wonderful thoughts in his head but he would not say what they were because he knew no one could understand them but himself. When the tin woodman walked about, he felt his heart rattling around in his breast, and he told Dorothy he had discovered it to be a kinder and more tender heart than the one he had owned when he was made of flesh. The lion declared he was afraid of nothing on earth, and would gladly face an army of men or a dozen of the fierce Kalidas. Thus each of the little party was satisfied except Dorothy who longed more than ever to get back to Kansas. On the fourth day, to her great joy, Oz sent for her. And when she entered the throne room, he said pleasantly, "'Sit down, my dear. I think I have found a way to get you out of this country.' "'And back to Kansas?' she asked eagerly. "'Well, I'm not sure about Kansas,' said Oz, "'for I haven't the faintest notion where it lies. But the first thing to do is to cross the desert, and then it should be easy to find your way home. How can I cross the desert? she inquired. Well, I'll tell you what I think, said the little man. You see, when I came to this country, it was in a balloon. You also came through the air being carried by a cyclone. So I believe the best way to get across the desert will be through the air. Now it is quite beyond my powers to make a cyclone, but I've been thinking the matter over and I believe I can make a balloon. How? asked Dorothy. A balloon, said Oz, is made of silk, which is coated with glue to keep the gas in it. I have plenty of silk in the palace, so it will be no trouble for us to make the balloon. But in all this country there is no gas to fill a balloon with, to make it float. If it won't float, remarked Dorothy, it will be of no use to us. True, answered Oz. But there is another way to make it float, which is to fill it with hot air. Hot air isn't as good as gas, for if the air should get cold, the balloon would come down in the desert and we should be lost. We? exclaimed the girl. Are you going with me? Yes, of course, replied Oz. I am tired of being such a humbug. If I should go out of this palace, my people would soon discover I am not a wizard, and then they would be vexed with me for having deceived them. So I have to stay shut up in these rooms all day, and it gets tiresome. I'd much rather go back to Kansas with you and be in a circus again. I shall be glad to have your company, said Dorothy. Thank you, he answered. Now, if you will help me sew the salt together, we will begin to work on our balloon. So Dorothy took a needle and thread, and as fast as Oz cut the strips of silk into proper shape, the girls sewed them neatly together. First there was a strip of light green silk, then a strip of dark green, and then a strip of emerald green, for Oz had a fancy to make the balloon in different shades of the colour about them. It took three days to sew all the strips together, but when it was finished they had a big bag of green silk more than twenty feet long. Then Oz painted it on the inside with a coat of thin glue to make it airtight after which he announced that the balloon was ready. "'But we must have a basket to ride in,' he said. So he sent the soldier with the green whiskers for a big clothes basket, which he fastened with many ropes to the bottom of the balloon. When it was all ready, Oz sent word to his people that he was going to make a visit to a great brother wizard who lived in the clouds. The news spread rapidly throughout the city, and everyone came to see the wonderful sight. Oz ordered the balloon carried out in front of the palace, and the people gazed upon it with much curiosity. The tin woodman had chopped a big pile of wood, and now he made a fire of it, and Oz held the bottom of the balloon over the fire, so that the hot air that arose from it would be caught in the silken bag. Gradually the balloon swelled out, 
and rose into the air, until finally the basket just touched the ground. Then Oz got into the basket and said to all the people in a loud voice, I am now going away to make a visit. While I am gone, the scarecrow will rule over you. I command you to obey him as you would me. The balloon was by this time tugging hard at the rope that held it to the ground, for the air within it was hot, and this made it so much lighter in weight than the air without that it pulled hard to rise into the sky. Come, Dorothy, cried the wizard. Hurry up, or the balloon will fly away. I can't find Toto anywhere, replied Dorothy who did not wish to leave her little dog behind. Toto had run into the crowd to bark at a kitten, and Dorothy at last found him. She picked him up and ran toward the balloon. She was within a few steps of it, and Oz was holding out his hands to help her into the basket, when crack went the ropes, and the balloon rose into the air without her. "'Come back!' she screamed. "'I want to go too!' "'I can't come back, my dear!' called Oz from the basket. "'Goodbye!' Goodbye, Goodbye, shouted everyone, and all eyes were turned upward to where the wizard was riding in the basket, rising every moment, farther and farther into the sky. And that was the last any of them ever saw of Oz, the wonderful wizard, though he may have reached Omaha safely and be there now for all we know. But the people remembered him lovingly and said to one another, Oz was always our friend. When he was here, he built for us this beautiful emerald city and now he is gone, he has left us the wise scarecrow to rule over us. Still for many days, they grieved over the loss of the wonderful wizard, and would not be comforted. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of The Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Stanley Away to the South Dorothy wept bitterly at the passing of her hope to get home to Kansas again, but when she thought it all over, she was glad she had not gone up in a balloon, and she also felt sorry at losing Oz, and so did her companions. The tin woodman came to her and said, Truly, I should be ungrateful if I failed to mourn for the man who gave me my lovely heart. I should like to cry a little because Oz is gone, if you will kindly wipe away my tears so that I shall not rust. With pleasure, she answered, and brought a towel at once. Then the tin woodman wept for several minutes, and she watched the tears carefully and wiped them away with the towel. When he had finished, he thanked her kindly and oiled himself thoroughly with his jewelled oil can to guard against mishap. The scarecrow was now the ruler of the Emerald City and although he was not a wizard, the people were proud of him. For, they said, there is not another in the city in all the world that is ruled by a stuffed man. And, so far as they knew, they were quite right. The morning after the balloon had gone up with Oz, the four travellers met in the throne room and talked matters over. The scarecrow sat in the big throne, and the others stood respectfully before him. We are not so unlucky, said the new ruler, for this palace and the Emerald City belong to us, and we can do just as we please. When I remember that a short time ago I was up on a pole in a farmer's cornfield, and that I am now the ruler of this beautiful city, I am quite satisfied with my lot. I also, said the tin woodman, am well pleased with my new heart, and really that was the only thing I wished in the whole world. For my part, I am content in knowing that I am as brave as any beast that ever lived, if not braver, said the lion modestly. If Dorothy could only be contented to live in the Emerald City, continued the scarecrow, we might all be happy together. But I don't want to live here, cried Dorothy. I want to go to Kansas and live with Aunt Em and Uncle Henry. Well then, what can be done? inquired the woodman. The scarecrow decided to think, and he thought so hard that the pins and needles began to stick out of his brains. Finally he said, Why not call the winged monkeys and ask them to carry you over the desert? I never thought of that, said Dorothy joyfully. It's just the thing. I'll go at once for the golden cap. When she brought it to the throne room, 
she spoke the magic words and soon the band of winged monkeys flew in through an open window and stood beside her this is the second time you have called us said the monkey king bowing before the little girl what do you wish i want you to fly with me to kansas said dorothy but the monkey king shook his head that cannot be done he said we belong to this country alone and cannot leave it there has never been a winged monkey in kansas yet and i suppose there never will be for they don't belong there we shall be glad to serve you in any way in our power but we cannot cross the desert good-bye and with another bow the monkey king spread his wings and flew away through the window followed by all his band dorothy was almost ready to cry with disappointment i have wasted the charm of the golden cap to no purpose she said for the winged monkeys cannot help me it is certainly too bad said the tender-hearted woodman the scarecrow was thinking again and his head bulged out so horribly that dorothy feared it would burst let us call in the soldier with the green whiskers he said and ask his advice so the soldier was summoned and entered the throne room timidly for while oz was alive he never was allowed to come further than the door this little girl said the scarecrow to the soldier wishes to cross the desert how can she do so i cannot tell answered the soldier for nobody has ever crossed the desert unless it is oz himself is there no one who can help me asked dorothy earnestly glinda might he suggested who is glinda inquired the scarecrow the witch of the south she is the most powerful of all the witches and rules over the quadlings besides her castle stands on the edge of the desert so she may know a way to cross it glinda is a good witch isn't she asked the child the quadlings think she's good said the soldier and she is kind to everyone i've heard that glinda is a beautiful woman who knows how to keep young in spite of the many years she has lived how can i get to her castle asked dorothy the road is straight to the south he answered but it is said to be full of dangers to travellers there are wild beasts in the woods and a race of queer men who do not like strangers to cross their country for this reason none of the quadlings ever came to the emerald city the soldier then left them and the scarecrow said it seems in spite of dangers that the best thing dorothy can do is to travel to the land of the south and ask glinda to help her for of course if dorothy stays here she will never get back to kansas you must have been thinking again remarked the tin woodman i have said the scarecrow i shall go with dorothy declared the lion for i am tired of your city and long for the woods and the country again i am really a wild beast you know besides dorothy will need some one to protect her that is true agreed the woodman my axe may be of service to her so i also will go with her to the land of the south when shall we start asked the scarecrow are you going they asked in surprise certainly if it wasn't for dorothy i should never have had brains she lifted me from the pole in the cornfield and brought me to the emerald city so my good luck is all due to her and i shall never leave her until she starts back to kansas for good and all thank you said dorothy gratefully you are all very kind to me but i should like to start as soon as possible we shall go tomorrow morning returned the scarecrow so now let us all get ready for it'll be a long journey End of chapter 18chapter nineteen of the wonderful wizard of oz by l frank baum this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn stanley attacked by the fighting trees the next morning dorothy kissed the pretty green girl good-bye and they all shook hands with a soldier with the green whiskers who had walked with them as far as the gate when the guardian of the gate saw them again he wondered greatly that they could leave the beautiful city to get into new trouble but he at once unlocked their spectacles which he put back into the green box and gave them many good wishes to carry with them you are now our ruler he said to the scarecrow so you must come back to us as soon as possible i certainly shall if i am able the scarecrow replied 
but I must help Dorothy to get home first. As Dorothy bade the good-natured guardian a last farewell, she said, I have been very kindly treated in your lovely city, and every one has been good to me. I cannot tell you how grateful I am. Don't try, my dear, he answered. We should like to keep you with us. But if it is your wish to return to Kansas, I hope you will find a way. Then he opened the gate of the outer wall, and they walked forth and started upon their journey. The sun shone brightly as our friends turned their faces toward the land of the south. They were all in the best of spirits, and laughed and chatted together. Dorothy was once more filled with the hope of getting home, and the scarecrow and the tin woodman were glad to be of use to her. As for the lion, he sniffed the fresh air with delight, and whisked his tail from side to side in pure joy at being in the country again, while Toto ran around them and chased the moths and butterflies, barking merrily all the time. "'City life does not agree with me at all,' remarked the lion, as they walked along at a brisk pace. "'I have lost much flesh since I lived there, and now I am anxious for a chance to show the other beasts how courageous I have grown.' They now turned and took a last look at the Emerald City. All they could see was a mass of towers and steeples behind the green walls, and high up above everything the spires and the dome of the Palace of Oz. "'Oz was not such a bad wizard after all,' said the Tin Woodman, as he felt his heart rattling around in his breast. "'He knew how to give me brains, and very good brains too,' said the Scarecrow. "'If Oz had taken a dose of the same courage he gave me,' added the Lion, "'he would have been a brave man.' Dorothy said nothing. Oz had not kept the promise he made her, but he had done his best, so she forgave him. As he said, he was a good man, even if he was a bad wizard. The first day's journey was through the green fields and bright flowers that stretched about the Emerald City on every side. They slept that night on the grass, with nothing but the stars over them, and they rested very well indeed. In the morning they travelled on until they came to a thick wood. There was no way of going around it, for it seemed to extend to the right and left as far as they could see, and besides they did not dare change the direction of their journey for fear of getting lost, so they looked for a place where it would be easiest to get into the forest. The scarecrow, who was in the lead, finally discovered a big tree with such wide spreading branches that there was room for the party to pass underneath, so he walked forward to the tree, but just as he came under the first branches, they bent down and twined around him, and the next minute he was raised from the ground and flung headlong among his fellow travellers. This did not hurt the scarecrow, but it surprised him, and he looked rather dizzy when Dorothy picked him up. "'Here is another space between the trees,' called the lion. "'Let me try it first, said the scarecrow, "'for it doesn't hurt me to get thrown about.' He walked up to another tree as he spoke, but its branches immediately seized him and tossed him back again. "'This is strange!' exclaimed Dorothy. "'What shall we do?' "'The trees seem to have made up their minds to fight us and stop our journey,' remarked the lion. "'I believe I will try it myself,' said the woodman, and shouldering his axe he marched up to the first tree that had handled the scarecrow so roughly. When a big branch bent down to seize him, the woodman chopped at it so fiercely that he cut it in two. At once the tree began shaking all its branches, as if in pain and the tin woodman passed safely under it. "'Come on!' he shouted to the others. "'Be quick!' They all ran forward and passed under the tree without injury, except Toto, who was caught by a small branch and shaken until he howled. But the woodman promptly chopped off the branch and set the little dog free. The other trees of the forest did nothing to keep them back, so they made up their minds that only the first row of trees could bend down their branches and that probably these were the policemen of the forest, and given this wonderful power in order to keep strangers out of it. The four travellers walked with ease through the trees until they came to the further edge of the wood. Then, to their surprise, they found before them a high wall, which seemed to be made of white china. It was smooth like the surface of a dish, and higher than their heads. "'What shall we do now?' asked Dorothy. "'I will make a ladder,' 
said the tin woodman, for we certainly must climb over the wall. End of chapter 19「Twenty of the Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Stanley. The Dainty China Country. While the woodman was making a ladder from wood which he found in the forest, Dorothy lay down and slept, for she was tired by the long walk. The lion also curled himself up to sleep, and Toto lay beside him. The scarecrow watched the woodman while he worked and said to him, "'I cannot think why this wall is here, nor what it is made of.' "'Rest your brains, and do not worry about the wall,' replied the woodman. "'When we have climbed over it, we shall know what is on the other side.' After a time the ladder was finished. It looked clumsy, but the tin woodman was sure it was strong, and would answer their purpose. The scarecrow waked Dorothy, and the lion and Toto and told them that the ladder was ready. The scarecrow climbed up the ladder first, but he was so awkward that Dorothy had to follow close behind and keep him from falling off. When he got his head over the top of the wall, the scarecrow said, "'Oh, my!' "'Go on!' exclaimed Dorothy. So the scarecrow climbed further up and sat down on top of the wall, and Dorothy put her head over and cried, "'Oh, my!' just as the scarecrow had done. Then Toto came up and immediately began to bark, but Dorothy made him be still. The lion climbed the ladder next, and the tin woodman came last, but both of them cried, Oh my! as soon as they looked over the wall. When they were all sitting in a row on the top of the wall, they looked down and saw a strange sight. Before them was a great stretch of country having a floor as smooth and shining and white, as the bottom of a big platter. Scattered around were many houses, made entirely of china, and painted in the brightest colours. These houses were quite small, the biggest of them reaching only as high as Dorothy's waist. There were also pretty little barns with china fences around them, and many cows and sheep and horses and pigs and chickens, all made of china, were standing about in groups. But the strangest of all were the people who lived in this queer country. They were milkmaids and shepherdesses, with bright-coloured bodices and golden spots all over their gowns. The princesses with most gorgeous frocks of silver and gold and purple, and shepherds dressed in knee-breeches with pink and yellow and blue stripes down them, and golden buckles on their shoes, and princes with jewelled crowns upon their heads, wearing ermine robes and satin doublets, and funny clowns in ruffled gowns, with round red spots upon their cheeks and tall pointed caps. And strangest of all, these people were all made of china, even to their clothes, and were so small that the tallest of them was no higher than Dorothy's knee. No one did so much as look at the travellers at first, except one little purple china dog with an extra large head, which came to the wall and barked at them in a tiny voice, afterwards running away again. "'How shall we get down?' asked Dorothy. "'They found the ladder so heavy they could not pull it up, "'so the scarecrow fell off the wall and the others jumped down upon him "'so that the hard floor would not hurt their feet. "'Of course they took pains not to light on his head "'and get the pins in their feet. "'When all was safely down, they picked up the scarecrow, "'whose body was quite flattened out, "'and patted his straw into shape again. "'We must cross the strange place in order to get to the other side.' said Dorothy, for it would be unwise for us to go any other way except due south. They began walking through the country of the China people, and the first thing they came to was a China milkmaid milking a China cow. As they drew near, the cow suddenly gave a kick and kicked over the stool, the pail, and even the milkmaid herself, all falling on the China ground with a great clatter. Dorothy was shocked to see that the cow had broken her leg short off and that the pail was lying in several small pieces, while the poor milkmaid had a nick in her left elbow. There, cried the milkmaid angrily, see what you have done. My cow has broken her leg, and I must take her to the mender's shop and have it glued on again. What do you mean by coming here and frightening my cow? I'm very sorry, 
returned Dorothy. Please forgive us. But the pretty milkmaid was much too vexed to make any answer. She picked up the leg sulkily and led her cow away, the poor animal limping on three legs. As she left them, the milkmaid cast many reproachful glances over her shoulder at the clumsy strangers, holding her nicked elbow close to her side. Dorothy was quite grieved at this mishap. "'We must be very careful here,' said the kind-hearted woodman, "'or we may hurt these pretty little people so they will never get over it.' A little farther on, Dorothy met a most beautiful dressed young princess, who stopped short when she saw the strangers and started to run away. Dorothy wanted to see more of the princess, so she ran after her, but the china girl cried out, "'Don't chase me! Don't chase me!' She had such a frightened little voice that Dorothy stopped and said, "'Why not?' "'Because,' answered the princess, also stopping a safe distance away, "'if I run I may fall down and break myself.' "'But couldn't you be mended?' asked the girl. "'Oh, yes, but one is never so pretty after being mended, you know,' replied the princess. "'I suppose not,' said Dorothy. "'Now there is Mr. Joker, one of our clowns,' continued the china lady, "'who is always trying to stand upon his head. "'He has broken himself so often.' that he has mended in a hundred places, and doesn't look at all pretty. Here he comes now, so you can see for yourself. Indeed, a jolly little clown now came walking toward them, and Dorothy could see that in spite of his pretty clothes of red and yellow and green, he was completely covered with cracks, running every which way, and showing plainly that he had been mended in many places. The clown put his hands in his pockets, and after puffing out his cheeks and nodding his head at them, saucily he said, "'My lady fair, why do you stare? "'At poor old Mr. Joker. "'You're quite as stiff and prim as if you'd eaten up a poker.' "'Be quiet, sir,' said the princess. "'Can't you see these are strangers and should be treated with respect?' "'Well, that is respect, I expect,' declared the clown, "'and immediately stood upon his head. "'Don't mind, Mr. Joker,' said the princess to Dorothy. "'He is considerably cracked in his head.' "'and that makes him foolish.' "'Oh, I don't mind him a bit,' said Dorothy. "'But you are so beautiful,' she continued, "'that I am sure I could love you dearly. "'Won't you let me carry you back to Kansas "'and stand you on Aunt Em's mantel-shelf? "'I could carry you in my basket.' "'That would make me very unhappy,' answered the China Princess. "'You see, here in our own country we live contentedly "'and can talk and move around as we please.' But whenever any of us are taken away, our joints at once stiffen, and we can only stand straight and look pretty. Of course, that is all that is expected of us when we are on mantel shelves and cabinets and drawing room tables. But our lives are much pleasanter here in our own country. I would not make you unhappy for all the world, exclaimed Dorothy. So I'll just say good-bye. Good-bye, replied the princess. They walked carefully through the china country. The little animals and all the people scampered out of their way, fearing the strangers would break them. And after an hour or so, the travellers reached the other side of the country and came to another china wall. It was not as high as the first, however, and by standing upon the lion's back they all managed to scramble to the top. Then the lion gathered his legs under him and jumped on the wall. But just as he jumped he upset a china church with his tail, and smashed it all to pieces. "'That was too bad,' said Dorothy. "'But really, I think we are lucky in not doing these little people more harm than breaking a cow's leg and a church. They are all so brittle.' "'They are indeed,' said the scarecrow, "'and I am thankful I am made of straw and cannot be easily damaged. There are worse things in the world than being a scarecrow.'" End of chapter 20「Chapter Twenty One of the Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Stanley. The Lion Becomes King of Beasts. After climbing down from the China Wall, the travellers found themselves in a disagreeable country, full of bogs and marshes, and covered with tall, rank grass. It was difficult to walk far without falling into muddy holes, for the grass was so thick that it hid them from sight. 
However, by carefully picking their way, they got safely along until they reached solid ground. But here the country seemed wilder than ever, and after a long and tiresome walk through the underbrush, they entered another forest, where the trees were bigger and older than any they had ever seen. This forest is perfectly delightful, declared the lion, looking around him with joy. Never have I seen a more beautiful place. It seems gloomy, said the scarecrow. Not a bit of it, answered the lion. I should like to live here all my life. See how soft the dried leaves are under your feet, and how rich and green the moss is that clings to these old trees. Surely no wild beast could wish a pleasanter home. Perhaps there are wild beasts in the forest now, said Dorothy. I suppose there are, returned the lion, but I do not see any of them about. They walked through the forest until it became too dark to go any farther. Dorothy and Toto and the lion lay down to sleep, while the woodman and the scarecrow kept watch over them as usual. When morning came, they started again. Before they had gone far, they heard a low rumble, as of the growling of many wild animals. Toto whimpered a little, but none of the others was frightened, and they kept along the well-trodden path until they came to an opening in the wood in which were gathered hundreds of beasts of every variety. There were tigers and elephants and bears and wolves and foxes and all the others in the natural history. And for a moment Dorothy was afraid. But the lion explained that the animals were holding a meeting, and he judged by their snarling and growling that they were in great trouble. As he spoke, several of the beasts caught sight of him, and at once the great assemblage hushed as if by magic. The biggest of the tigers came up to the lion and bowed, saying, Welcome, O king of beasts! You have come in good time to fight our enemy and bring peace to all the animals of the forest once more. What is your trouble? asked the lion quietly. We are all threatened, answered the tiger, by a fierce enemy which has lately come into this forest. It is a most tremendous monster, like a great spider with a body as big as an elephant, and legs as long as a tree trunk. It has eight of these long legs, and as the monster crawls through the forest, he seizes an animal with a leg and drags it to his mouth, where he eats it as a spider does a fly. Not one of us is safe while this fierce creature is alive, and we had called a meeting to decide how to take care of ourselves when you came among us. The lion thought for a moment. Are there any other lions in this forest? he asked. No, but there were some, but the monsters eaten them all, and besides, there were none of them nearly so large and brave as you. If I put an end to your enemy, will you bow down to me and obey me as king of the forest? inquired the lion. We will do that gladly, returned the tiger, and all the other beasts roared with a mighty roar. We will! Where is this great spider of yours now? asked the lion. Yonder among the oak trees said the tiger, pointing with his forefoot. "'Take good care of these friends of mine,' said the lion, "'and I will go at once to fight the monster.' He bade his comrades good-bye and marched proudly away to do battle with the enemy. The great spider was lying asleep when the lion found him, and it looked so ugly that its foe turned up his nose in disgust. Its legs were quite as long as the tiger had said, and its body covered with coarse black hair. It had a great mouth with a row of sharp teeth, a foot long. But its head was joined to the pudgy body by a neck, as slender as a wasp's waist. This gave the lion a hint of the best way to attack the creature, and as he knew it was easier to fight it asleep than awake, he gave a great spring and landed directly upon the monster's back. Then, with one blow of his heavy paw, all armed with sharp claws, he knocked the spider's head from its body. Jumping down, he watched it until the long legs stopped wiggling, when he knew it was quite dead. The lion went back to the opening where the beasts of the forest were waiting for him, and said proudly, You need fear your enemy no longer. Then the beasts bowed down to the lion as their king, and he promised to come back and rule over them as soon as Dorothy was safely on her way to Kansas. End of chapter 21